because we don't have that much time. But I want to talk to you guys about commitment because I think it ties into what the conference was about in regards to discipleship, right? I want to talk to you guys about uh, commitment. And a lot of you guys know, and a lot of you guys have a background that's similar to, uh, to mine, but of course I started using drugs at a, at a young age. Um, I'm not, you know, one of those guys, and I, and I know that they do exist, but there are people, believe it or not, that they're addicts, and they've used drugs for a lot of years, but they used drugs while they were in the church. And I'm not sure how that works, but I know that it's, it's, it's it can be done. <laughs> it can be done. And, and some people, but that wasn't my, that wasn't my experience. And so prior to giving my life to Jesus Christ, I didn't have a lot of Christian experience and really no Bible knowledge at all to know much about God. So I guess in my mind, um, what I thought, if somebody were to ask me, what I thought was, if I thought that the idea was to be good so God doesn't punish you. To be a good person so that when you die, you go to heaven to spend eternity with God. That, that's, if you would have asked me, that's probably the answer. If you would have said, hey Mario, what about God? you know anything about God? I would probably say, yeah, you know, if you're good, then He's not going to punish you. I, I don't know, I guess He likes to punish people. But He won't punish you if you're good, right? And then if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. Well, if you think that way... The next question, if we're going to be honest, if we're going to be honest adults, the next question is, okay, what is good? And how do you answer that question? What is good? Right? And the next question would be, if we're going to talk about compromise, and we are, if you don't know what good is, then how can you determine what compromise is? Those are good questions. I, 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 uh, we, the reason that Lorenzo and I were ladies is because we drove through Los Angeles, took the 10 freeway, and there were all of these uh, people marching in the highway patrol, the sheriff's department. They closed off the road there for a little while while these people went through. And they were talking, they were holding up signs. I saw one sign about America being nice again, about America being a good nation again. And I want to roll down my window and say, what is good? <laughs> Come to 7929 Melrose, let's talk about what is good. But that's a good question. What is good? And if you know the answer to that, then you would also know what is compromise. The fact of the matter is, without the Bible, we really can't determine what's good. You know, the guy, I don't know if he's the president or the prime minister or whatever he is, but that whack job of a leader at North, in North Korea, if you were to ask him what is good at this point in his life, at this point where his country is right now, he would say what is good is for me to toss one of these big nuclear rockets at the mainland of the United States of America. That's what he would say. To him, that would be good. So when we talk about good, that's really all over the place. When we talk about compromise, that's all over the place without the Bible, right? So one thing for sure, before we move any further, is um, being good has nothing to do with salvation. There is no good person that is going to go to heaven. And good works are not what saves us. If that was the case, we should all just pack it up and go home now. What saves us is the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. For that reason, our sins are forgiven. For that reason, our lives are being restored day by day by day. Right? So I'm not talking about being good in regards to that. I'm not talking about compromise in regards to that. That's already been established. The work's done. If you have Jesus Christ as your God, as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. All right? But I'm talking about what is good because if we don't know what is good, then all we're going to do is live a life of compromise. Right? And so, the answer is, without God's Word, we don't know what good is, and we don't know what compromise is. It's just whatever you want to make it. And that's what a lot of people do today. A lot of people. People in recovery too. They say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be closed-minded and define my God. Really, Why? Oh, well, my God doesn't have a name. Really? Why? You know, well, there's no specifics where God is concerned. Why? Why do you choose a God like that? You know why? Because if you choose a God like that, then you get to make up all the rules. 
Now for anybody in the world, I would say, hey, if that's your life, hey, you're making a lot of money, you've got a career, you're doing big things, go head on. You're not going to find salvation, but live it up here in this world. But to a recovering drug addict, I say, be careful because you already destroyed your life real good one time. Don't go round two with this thing. Let God be God. Call Him by His name. Be honest with yourself about who He is. Because He'll meet you right where you're at. But if you try to do your own thing, call Him what you want. Make up whatever you want to make up about who God is. Then you're really becoming the God of your life. And you said in that meeting that you are prone to self-destruction. I've heard it tens of thousands of times. So to those people, I would, see, I would say, uh, be careful. But, and just to give you a little bit of my background, if you don't know already, I had been too clean, off heroin, no alcohol, no pills, no, absolutely nothing for 12 long years doing my own thing according to my plan, according to my rules, and it took me to a place of suffering and disappointment. I mean, for years, I could go to a meeting and I could fake it. I could smile. Oh, I could repeat. I became a parrot. I could repeat things that I heard. So I said, Woo, Mario, heavy, oh boy, you know, all that. <laughs> but it was all lies. It was all a front. I was wearing a mask. And I did that for 12 years. And you know what? My life, the, the suffering and the disappointment that came. And you know what the worst part of it was? I had no excuse. I couldn't blame heroin anymore. Heroin was not there for me to blame anymore, right? Well, if you come from that place, um, then you know that morality and compromise are whatever you want to make it because you have no definite markers, right? If you're playing uh, football, high school, college, professional, then, you know, there's all of these white lines around the, the football field, right? And then there's these other lines that go across and they're numbered, Right? Why is that? Because those are definite markers. Right? We can't determine whether or not you got a first down coming if, you, if there were no lines there. We'll be arguing about it all day. Right? And so that's what happens to us, to, to, to myself and to many people. Uh, when we come from a place like that, our morality, uh, the morality comp everything is compromised because there's no definite marker. Live and do the things you want to do. Who can call you a bad person? Who could say you're doing it wrong? Answer, nobody. Right? Because the rules are just all over the place. So, because of God's grace, because of God's mercy... Like Pastor Raymond would say, at some point he shows up and he interrupts our miserable lives. He interrupts our miserable lives. He saves us and then he gives us a new life to live. But how? How does he do that? How does God introduce us to a new way of life? If somebody were to ask you that question, what would you say? Oh yeah, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. I, I live a new life. Now really how? What was the formula? What did God do for you? That gave you that new life. Think about that for a minute. Did he zap you? I didn't get zapped. I didn't see a cross in the sky. How did God... Somebody held up a Bible. That's exactly... This is the part we don't like all the time. But the way, the method that God worked this new way of life out for us, He gave us rules. Isn't that what He did? That's why we read Scripture. Christians who don't know their Bible don't know about the rules. And there are rules. There has to be rules. These rules are the boundaries. They tell us when we're out of bounds. Right? They tell us, you know, fourth down, second down, first down. Right? Penalty. <laughs> rules. Rules for living. Rules for life. And so there's a lot of people that they come to Jesus Christ, but they say, I come to Jesus Christ and I'm saved, but I'm not down with the rules. Well, aren't you then just living the way you were living before you met Jesus Christ? If you're not adopting His rules, right? And so God interrupts our lives. He introduces Himself to us. And then He gives us these rules, right? And we, if you're like me, we celebrate say, Wow, I can, I'm saved. I'm really saved now. I'm on my way. My life's going to be transformed. And if I die tomorrow, I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. 
And we all have that story. It's not an uncommon, it's a very common story, isn't it? That's a very common story. I mean, we celebrate every time we hear the story. It's, a, it's a, one of the greatest things we're ever going to, to experience here on earth. But is it, is it uncommon? It's not uncommon. It's very common. God's been doing that with countless people for thousands of years. So it's very common, right? But you know what else is very common? Is that when God interrupts our lives and He, he saves us by the work that He's done... And he gives us the rules. The other thing that is common is compromise. Compromise. People begin to compromise the rules that God gave them. Even after God has done so much for them. Even after they talk about faith and the power of God. They begin to compromise the rules. And you know what happens when we begin to compromise the rules? We end up in a place of suffering and disappointment the same way we were before we met Him. The same way. Some people call it the vicious circle. You can call it whatever you want. But if we compromise, at the end of the compromise, we're going to find ourselves in the same spiritual, mental, and emotional condition we did when we, first, when we were at before we first met Him. So God always warns us not to compromise. Right? But it's not just a warning. God knows how weak and feeble we are. You know, if you're in recovery, you're always warned. Don't get a big head because you have 10 years clean. You ain't accomplished anything. Right? Don't get a big head when you come up on a year. Don't get a big head when someone asks you to sponsor them. Or whatever. Right? And if you're not in recovery, maybe you get that promotion. Maybe you get a title. Maybe you get that degree. Right? And, and it, you're, we're warned, don't get a big head. You know why? Because each one of us has a foundation made of clay. It can crack, it can crumble at any given moment. Just let the right circumstances come along and we will fall on our face. You think God doesn't know that about us? Do you think God thinks that you're some great, fantastic, powerful individual? Not at all. Not, it's written in the Word. He knows exactly. Who, he calls us jars of clay. He doesn't call us uh, uh, jars of iron. Jars of clay. He knows how feeble we are. He knows how ignorant we are. He knows how gullible we are. You ever go fishing? How many people go, have gone fishing here? You know when you go fishing, you could use live bait, like an anchovy, uh, you know, a minnow, whatever, live bait. You can use a worm. But you know fish are so stupid, you don't have to use live bait at all. You could just get a shiny object with a hook in it, throw it out there, and the fish just come. They chase that shiny object. It has no flavor of food. It has no aroma of food. It's just a shiny object. And they come and they bite it and you bring them in. We're that way. And God knows that full well. So would God then command you and order you to say, Obey me, John! You've got to obey me! Roll up your sleeves, Christina, and do it! Obey me! Stop compromising! God would never do that because He knows we're not capable of doing that. So instead, what does God tell us? To make us people that don't compromise. What does He tell us? Because if we know the answer to that, we're also going to know why we tend to compromise. And so many people don't know. And so they're busy, they're busy. I spoke at a conference uh, yesterday, yesterday morning. And they had uh, MC, uh, or MC Boulevard, what is that guy? Something Boulevard. He's a rapper guy, right? And man, everybody, whoa, whoa. They had the Victory Outreach guy. You know, I mean, they're excited. They were excited. It was, it was a great time, right? Um, but you know, all that emotion, all that passion, that will not keep you from compromising the rules. There's something that will, though. There's something that will keep us from compromising the rules. And it, this is not a football game that we're talking. This is not a boxing match. We're not talking about not compromising because we're going to be some kind of hero. We're talking about not compromising so that we don't end up in that place of spiritual relapse, which is bad, which is bad. You find yourself there. Some people just commit suicide, man. 
It's bad to be in that spot. So that's why we're talking about this issue, because we don't want to end up there. So if, if you have your Bible, I think I've got to put it on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 11. In there, we're going to find the answer to, uh, to, as to what keeps us from compromise. And I'm going to try to get through this real quick. I think we've got 20 minutes left. Let me give you a little bit of background to tell you what it is that's going on here. Okay? Before you get to Deuteronomy chapter 11, you're going to read a lot of information. The book of Exodus, the book of Numbers, the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Leviticus. You're going to read about these people that the Bible calls Israelites or the children of Israel. Okay? Israelites or the children of Israel. This, I'm you, going back, oh man, maybe 3,500 years, long before the church was ever established. These were the people of God. Okay? And so these people were in Egypt. And they had lived in Egypt for 400 years. And the Bible says they were in bondage because Egypt had a pharaoh, which would be the ruler, the prime minister, the, the president of Egypt, right? He was the pharaoh. And when they first, the children of Israel, the Israelites, when they first got to Egypt, the pharaoh treated them very kindly, gave them their own place to live, yeah, let them raise their cattle and their sheep over there on a hill. It's a hilly area, a lot of green grass. It's called Goshen. And they stayed there, and they did well. They were treated nice. But as time passed, okay, Pharaoh became very, very cruel. He began to make slaves out of those people. He had them working hard, long hours, and he wouldn't pay them. Okay, and what they were doing is they were making bricks. That's what they were doing. They were just making bricks. They were just like, remember when you were using? All you did was exist from one day to the next. You ate, got your drugs, went to sleep, woke up, ate, got your drugs, went to sleep. Sometimes you didn't eat, got your drugs, went to sleep. All you did was exist. And even if you're not a drug addict or an alcoholic or whatever, without Jesus Christ, if you're going to be honest, all you really did was exist. There was no hope for the future. And if, and if there was chaos in your life, you probably thought to yourself, okay, i got to figure this out. But you know that sometimes the problems were too big to figure out. So without Jesus Christ, no matter who you are, all you really do is exist from day to day. There's no hope for the future without Him. Right? These people just existed from day to day. And they worked harder and they worked longer as the years progressed. And then at one point, you know, they used to make these bricks out of clay and out of straw and water. And Pharaoh took the straw and he said, you know what? You're going to make me bricks without the straw now. Just because that's the way I feel. It's all in the Bible. You can read it in the, in the book of Exodus. They were treated very, very brutally. And Pharaoh would not let them leave. They couldn't leave. I, I don't know about you, but this describes my life. In fact, if you ever get around to reading the book of Exodus, okay... Cross out the name Pharaoh. Every time you come to Pharaoh's name, cross it out and put Satan. And every time you come to the word Egypt, cross it out and put the world. And every time you come to the children of Israel, or the Israelites, cross it out and put your name. And every time you come to Moses, cross it out and put Jesus. And I guarantee you're going to read that story is going to blow your mind. Because you're going to see your own personal life in that book. Where you were at, how you only existed, how the Lord saved you, and what happened afterwards. Right? And so... What happens is God made a move. It's the Bible says that He heard the cries of His people. Right? And so God called a guy named Moses. And Moses is one of my heroes. When I get to heaven, I'm going to have a long talk with Moses. Seriously. I admire that guy greatly. And God told Moses, He said, Listen, I want you to go to Israel and I want you to talk to Pharaoh because he's going to let my people go. And Moses said, Man, I really don't want to go. You should find somebody else. And God said, no, no, let's talk. You're going to go. Moses had an issue. Moses had an issue. His issue was the last time he was in Egypt, he killed a dude. He was a murderer and they knew it. So God is actually asking him to go back where there might be a warrant for his arrest. Among other things. He had failed the first time trying to do it his way. You know, how many Christians give their life to the Lord but say, move out of the way, Lord. I'm going to do it my way. Right? Moses was no exception. So he failed. Now he's in the wilderness. God calls him. Anyway, after a, a, a couple of short conversations, Moses says, okay, I'll go. I'll go down there and I'll do what you tell me to do. God says, okay, good. Go down there and tell Pharaoh he's got to let my people go. But Pharaoh was a very proud man. 
And he had a lot of power, earthly power, but he had power. So Moses went over there and Pharaoh says, that's cool, but I'm not letting them go. Moses says, you better be careful. They got a God and that God don't play. And he wants his people free. And Pharaoh said, yeah, well, you can tell their God such and such. Because they ain't going nowhere. But God was kind. and he, he loved his people. So he sent ten plagues on Pharaoh in all of Egypt. Really bad plagues. You could read them in the book of Exodus. But you know what happened? When God sent the plagues over Egypt, God's people were not affected by the plagues. Only the Egyptians and Pharaoh. It's amazing. Eventually... Pharaoh bends his knee and he lets God's people go. They're free. And God parts the Red Sea. If you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, God parted the Red Sea and His people walked through. The, God dried the land, right? They walked through on dry land. And then Pharaoh realizes, man, why did I do that? That was a mistake. Let's go get him. And so Pharaoh and his army, they go through the Red Sea themselves. But after the last Israelite uh, crossed over, the Red Sea, God made it so that it closed. And it closed in on Pharaoh and all of his army. They all got killed in there. So now the Israelites get to the other side of the, of the Red Sea. And they celebrate. They're dancing. They're happy. You read the, the book of Exodus. And songs that they wrote that they were actually singing are written in there. And they're dancing and they're celebrating with probably hands up. Praise the God who created the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, right? And you know what happened after that? God called them together and He gave them rules. Rules, the Ten Commandments. And in the book of Leviticus, all kinds of rules. How you do this, how you do that, when you do it, right? God did not give these people rules to give them a hard time. He gave them the rules so that these rules would bless their lives. And not only their lives, but the lives of their children. And the people, knowing that at the time, they promised to obey. Moses said, here's the rule. He said, we promise we'll obey. We will incorporate those rules in our lives. God even promised them a special place that they would go to, the promised land, Israel. He said, I got this place for you guys, man. It's going to take 7, 11 days to walk there from where you were at. But this place is so beautiful, a land of milk and honey. They grow grapes as big as your face in the place that I have for you. And so God made them all of these promises. But you know what happened? After a while, God's people in the Old Testament did what we so often in the New Testament do. They began to compromise the rules. At first, just a little bit, just a little bit of compromise. But if you guys have ever compromised the way I have, a little bit turns into a lot in a hurry. So over a period of time, they were worshiping other gods. God wanted them to be separate. God wanted them to be sanctified. But one day, some, some knucklehead there looked around at the other nations. And he said, you know, they, they, they're pretty cool, man. They worship this God. You know, and then they celebrate, you know, in ways that feed the flesh. And then those people, they do it a little different. And those people, they do it a little different. And you know what? It'd probably be good to incorporate some of that in our worship life. And before you know it, they became idolaters. Right, And so, rather than go directly to that beautiful place that God had for them, it took them 40 years to get there. And for those 40 years, they were suffering and totally disappointed in the middle of the desert. Man. Wandering from place to place, never knowing where they were going. Right? Let's read it, because in here is the answer... To, that'll keep us from compromise. We're going to read it. We're going to go through it really quickly. Bear with me for just a few minutes. Deuteronomy chapter 11. It says, Therefore, in, in spite of all that I've done for you, right? In spite of everything that God has done for you, He says, Therefore, 
You shall love the Lord your God and keep His charges, His statutes, His judgments, and His commandments always. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, His greatness and His mighty hand and His outstretched arm, His signs and His acts which He did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his land. What He did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, and how He made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you. And how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What He did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place. And what He did to Dathan and Abram and Eliab and the tribe of Reuben. How the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. Their household, their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which He did. So what God is reminding them of right here is what He did for them and what He did to them. When you read here about Reuben, that's one of the tribes of Israel. They were Israelites. God punished them and God chastised them. Now here's where a lot of people get it twisted. And they say, that's why I don't go to recovery house of worship. They're talking about a punishing God. And my God doesn't punish. Well, I can't speak for everybody, but I had a father growing up. It, my mother and my father, they divorced when I was 17. But until that time, I had a father in my household. He was an alcoholic, he was a womanizer, he was all those things. But a few times he confronted me, and twice he brought out the belt and he spanked me real good. I didn't like him for that then. But I'm a father now, and I've learned to appreciate that. A father that punishes his children is not an abusive father. A father who punishes his children is a father who is concerned, and a father who loves his children. I don't know where these people get. And I know some people had abusive fathers. You keep walking with the Lord. You're going to see He's not that way. All right? The other thing, he, he, he reminded them what He did to them and what He did for them. He saved them from bondage. Right? But He also punished them when they rebelled. And so, I would ask the question, has God ever saved you from trouble or bondage? The answer would be, of course. I know most of you, most of you I've known for a long time, but I know what this world has to offer. And if you're here, it's because the, the world did what it did and just brought you to your knees. Right? Nobody comes in here clapping and singing. Verse 8, Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey, for the land which you go to possess, this place is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and water it, uh, watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. You know what he's saying? He's saying this to the Old Testament people, but it's also a word for us. You know what he's saying? That God has a plan for your life. And it's better than the plan that you have for your life. You know, when I was young, I used to hang around this neighborhood of, uh, it's called Pico Rivera, on the east side over there. And you have Pico Viejo, old, tore up. You have Ardeen, old, tore up. But then you have Pico Nuevo. And Pico Nuevo is the, the new part of Pico Rivera. And there are all these little houses, and, and my brother used to live there. And there are all these little houses, little houses, 1,000, 1,200, big ones, maybe 1,500 square feet. But they're cared for and really nice. It's a nice place to live. And when I was running around there and I used to use, I used to say to myself, if I ever get it together, if I ever get clean, if I ever have a family, I want to live in Pico Nuevo. That, those were my goals. That's where I was at in my mind. My brother lived there. My father helped him get out. Maybe my dad. If I get clean, maybe my dad will help me get a house over here. And I'll raise my, they'll go to our rancho. You know. Nothing wrong with living in Pico Rivera. Nothing wrong. But I don't live in Pico Rivera today. <laughs> I live in a place that's much nicer. But if God would have said, Mario, okay, we'll do it according to your rules. That's where I would be. Listen, God has some stuff for us. He's got some promise for each one of us individually that are going to blow your mind. Bigger than anything that you can dream of. Bigger. Job, career, children, wife, all that stuff. Be very careful when you make the choice. Careful when you make the choice. 
Because you're going to shoot a lot lower. You're going to be aiming a lot lower than God's aim for your life. Right? So he's reminding of that. And listen, I'm almost out of time. Verses 13 to 15, it was where God commands His people to the place of the possessions that God has for them. But along the way, they, God leads His people to all the places where their needs are met. Okay? So what He's telling us in verses 13 to 15 is that I've got a place for you, a place of promise. Each one of you guys, I've got a spot for you. Okay? Now you're going to walk along the path that I've appointed to you. And there's going to be some struggles. There's going to be some difficulties. Anthony talked about his. Other, we all have difficulties. But I want you to stay on that path and listen to me. I want you to get this. You got to get this. As you walk along, not your path, the path that I appointed for you. You're going to be needing some things. The things that you need are going to be found along the way. If you take your path, hey, everything's you know, up for grabs. Your rules, your plan. But if you go down my path, eventually you're going to get to the things, the possessions that I promised for you. Right? And all the things you need, you're going to find along the way. Because God is so good. But now the question, and we're almost done. Why did the children of Israel waste all those years compromising in the middle of the desert, right? Compromising the commands that would have led them to the place that they really wanted to go. Their plan was never to be wandering in the desert for 40 years. When God told them about the promise, they said, oh my goodness, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Right? Why did they compromise? Why do we compromise today? When Listen, we, if we just re- reflect on what God has done for us so far, even helping us if you're an addict to get clean before you even knew Him. And I know He did it, and you know He did it, because I've heard your share, and you said it wasn't me, I couldn't have done it, God intervened, so you know, we're not even going to argue about that. But if we consider everything that God has done for us so far... Why do we at this point, at this stage of the game, begin to doubt Him? Why do we think that we're not? He's not going to be capable of getting us to the place that He's promised for us. That's beyond our wildest dreams. It's crazy. It's absurd. He's faithful, right? And so the question is, why did these people compromise and end up in the place that they never wanted, that, that they never wanted to be? And I'll tell you why. And it's in the scriptures. It's because they failed to love God. That's what happened. That's what happened. And it's in here. It's in verse 1 and it's in verse 13. Let me read it to you real quick. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep His charges, His statutes, His judgment, and His commandments always. See, to love Him. You know, it's, love is an interesting word. Sometimes it's an emotion. Sometimes love is an emotion. But love is always an action word. Sometimes it's an emotion. But love is always an action word. Okay? What happened is they at some point, some point, began to leave their love for God. Who had done all of that for them. Right? In the Bible, when you read the Bible... And you come to me and you tell me, man, Mario, I've been reading my Bible and I realize how much God loves me. And if I ask you, well, where does the Bible, what did the Bible tell you that you, you've come to that conclusion? You're not going to say, oh, I read it and it says, I love you, John. I love you, John. I love you. Oh, and by the way, John, did I tell you that I love you, that I love you, that I love you? The Bible doesn't say that. Instead, what does the Bible tell you when you read it? It tells you what God has done for you. Because love is an action word. And God is not going to bore you like some people. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you so much. Did I tell you that I love you? He's going to remind you of what He's done for you. Love is an action word. Right? So, in John chapter 14, verse 15, not Moses, but Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my rules. And Jesus, thank God for Jesus. He didn't give us ten rules. He gave us two. 
He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two things, you will find yourself obeying all ten of the commandments. I make it so simple for you, Jesus says. But you'll do it if you love me. If you don't love me, you won't do it. Right? And if you do it, hey, I know you love me. Right? Everything comes together with those circumstances in place. So, if Jesus saved you and also gave you rules to live by, rules that will bless you, that will bless your family, that will lead you to the possessions that He has for you, that will direct you along the path where all your needs will be met. You know what I know? And I know that you know it now. I know you don't want to compromise. I know you don't want to. If you believe what this Deuteronomy chapter 11 is telling us, what it's teaching us, I know you don't want to compromise. I know you don't. No way in the world. But I also know that you're not capable of holding to the rules that He gave you that will change your life. I'm not and you're not. We're very fragile. So what's the answer? Fall in love with the Lord. Fall in love with Him. Right? How do you do that? How do you fall in love with Jesus Christ? Listen, you're not going to be willing. I'm not willing. You're not. We're not made of that stuff. So how do we get to that place where we fall in love with the Lord? I'll tell you right now. Spend time with Him. Spend time with Him. Get into the Word. One of the speakers over the, the, the conference asked us all to commit to spending 10 or 15 minutes with the Lord every single morning. Very simple. Read the Word. Read the Word. This is the Word of God. Right? So read the Word. Pray. Speak to Him about your concerns. Right? Serve. Serve Him. Serve Him. Spend time with Him. Serve Him. You will fall in love with Him. And when you fall in love with Him, you're not going to want to do anything else but serve Him. And you will do it at any cost. And you're not going to roll up your say, I'm going to be sacrificial in how I serve Him today. This is going to be so automatic. So automatic. And you'll do it at any cost. And you'll sacrifice. And what you're going to find out sooner or later is whatever it is you sacrificed, He repays you back a hundred, a thousand fold. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm already out of time and I'm not going to talk about it now. But one of Camille's concerns and my concern and my mother's concerns is we were serving. We were going broke. One time I asked him, I sat Camille and the kids around the table and I said, listen to me. This is the life we chose. And your mother and I don't have the payment, the, 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 the mortgage payment to pay this month. We don't have it. And I don't want to hear no more crying. And I don't want to hear no more complaining. So I'm telling you, we might have to sell the house or it's going to go to foreclosure. And I don't know where we're going to go or what we're going to do. And I don't want to hear it. We chose this life. This is the way we're going to do it. I'm not happy about it either. I told them that. They were little. A couple of days later, Camille and I were at the office. where We had a little office where we rented and we worked. And we didn't say much to each other that morning. Right? And we're just thinking, what is life going to be like when we leave this house that we lived in all these years? Maybe, maybe I get the house in Pico Rivera. I don't know. And you know what happened? The mailman came and we didn't think anything. And the mailman came with a check that was about $50 or $70 more than the mortgage payment. And it was a deposit that I had paid to the city of Fontana with, because of a house that I had built there several years prior. Forgot all about it. They could have kept it. I would have never known. And Camille opened it up. And I said, go to the bank, ask him please not to put a hold on it and make the payment. And that's exactly what happened. And we had like 50 or 70 bucks left over. You know what? God did that. God, to show us this and stay on the path. You think you're sacrificing. You're not sacrificing anything. This is just an exercise in faith. That's what this is. Stay on the path. Everything you need is going to be on this side or that side of the road every time you need it. But Mario, don't compromise. Don't compromise. Exercise faith. That's what we're talking about here. Now I got to tell you, that morning I didn't have a lot of love for the Lord. But when the check came, we fell in love again. <laughs> True story. That's the way I am. I'm selfish that way. And I praise Jesus anyway. No, I did not. I didn't. 
But you know what? When these kinds of things happen, now I do. I say, oh, check it out. Stand back and watch what the Lord's going to do. Because I know who He is now. So keep from compromise by falling in love with the Lord. He's got so much for you. It's probably not going to happen tomorrow because you're so weak in your faith that your faith muscle needs to be exercised. But you're going to see it. You're going to see it. So remember, devotional time with the Lord, service, fall in love, and you're going to obey without compromise. You won't even be able to help it. And we've gone over. So thank you for your patience.